Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of the place Tabera, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell in, fell a lusting. And, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons, the leeks and the onions and the garlics. But now our soul is dried away, and there is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. And the manna was as coriander seed, and the color thereof as the color of uh, bedlam. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in meal and beat it in a mortar and baked it in pans and made cake of it. And the taste of it was the taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. When God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, he provided them with their daily portion of food. And it seemed to them, after traveling for a while, and uh, they were at Mount Sinai for a while, and they camped there, and Moses went up into the mountain, and God gave him the Ten Commandments. He come, while he was in the, up in the mountains, and the Ten Commandments were being written, the children of Israel got distracted, and there was a, a golden calf that was built. By them, and they brought all the jewelry that they, and things that they had brought out of Egypt and borrowed from the Egyptians, and they made themselves a golden calf and began to worship that golden calf. And when Moses came down, he said, "What on earth is going on?" And it angered him, and so and it bothered him so bad that he threw down the tablets of stone that God had given him and written with his hand. <clears throat> it was just. The commandments here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And we, most of us in this room today can, can quote most of the Ten Commandments in this, in this room today. We've heard it, and maybe some have not heard. But uh, the, great, the first commandment is, here, O Israel, there is one God. Amen? There is one Lord. And, and it all stems from that. God picked Abraham and he brought Abraham out of the Ur of the Chaldees. And then God picked the children of Jacob. And Jacob uh, took his family into Egypt. And they all were there for, and they ended up being there. It was a temporary moment. But it ended up being 430 years of bondage. And so they got tired of all of the bondage and they began to cry to God, I need, I, we need delivered from this bondage. It's more than I can take. It's more than I can handle. And uh, every day they just put more upon me than I can handle and take. And then it became a place where, Herod, where the Pharaoh began to kill all the, baby, the babies because the children of Israel were multiplying so quickly. And they, they were... Uh, growing so quick that he was afraid the children of Israel would take over Egypt and Egypt would become their slaves. And so he put more labor and more bondage upon them because he did not want them to come and take over what he had uh, there in, in the children of Israel. But we find it wasn't very far removed when the children of Israel had left Egypt until they had come to this place in chapter 11. And they begin to complain. I'm tired of eating Taco Bell every day. Now I could eat Pizza Point every day. I know some of you all would get tired of that. But I can eat pizza about every day of the week. It's just, it, it's just in me. <clears throat> but sometimes I'd have to take a break and I'd have to get me a sub or some, something a little different. But uh, I could eat pizza. But I could imagine after eating so much pizza that after a while I would just get tired of eating pizza. And then I would probably be, begin to complain. I mean, there's, there's enough pizza joints in Coshocton. Every variety and thing that you can think of. And so there's you know, Pizza Hut. Start naming it. Crowtown Plus One. There's, there's Domino's. There's all kinds of pizza points. There used to be Gardenia's when I was growing up and some other ones. And so there's just, I mean, you can only make pizza so many ways. Now they would fire it, and they they do all kinds of things. But after a while, you know, if I if I said Tracy, we're going to have pizza every night, she would get tired, and she would begin to complain. 
And if I came home from work every night and all I had was the same thing, I would probably start to complain. Right? But this had been going, this was God's provision for them. And God was taking care of them. Maybe they had manicotti one night. Man of lasagna. I'm sure they found creative ways to make, to make their manna. And how they baked it and they did things. And they used, and they were, <clears throat> I'm sure they had some herbs and I'm sure they had some spices and stuff that they used to make their manna with. But it was something that God had provided them. When they went into, when they went into the wilderness out of their, from their, their time that they spent those 430 years in bondage that they had been there. They spent all of that time there. And all they could think about after being in the wilderness for just a little while was I just can't, I wish we could go back where we could eat onions and herbs freely. They had been on their way to the promised land for a while, and they were just getting they were just getting provided angel food. They had angel food cake. They had angel food that God had provided for them. It was the uh, one scripture I read in Psalms that said it was the corn of heaven. So you can imagine being on a journey and going through life, and sometimes we get just get into the routine of life and doing life over and over, and we begin, uh, things get, we get so used to things that we begin to complain. Some people complain because they stayed at Mount Sinai too long. Some complained that they weren't there long enough. Some complained because they had to move just a three days journey and not a longer journey. Some wanted to go farther. Some, wanted, some didn't want to go. It's kind of like pastoring a church sometimes. That's just a joke. But you get comfortable sometimes in where you're at. Sometimes you, we become complacent and we, we start to complain when don't, we don't realize the whole time that God is with us and God is listening to us and God is taking us somewhere. But we get content sometimes with where we're at and we begin to complain. Some of them didn't realize that every time that the cloud moved, God was taking them closer to their purpose. When the cloud stopped, it was time for them to rest and regather and focus their attention and set their affections in the right order because the children of Israel had, ta- had trouble with focusing on the things of God. They always, they always did. If you, read the whole, if you read the whole Old Testament, you'll find the children of Israel had, time, had trouble staying focused on the things of God, on the blessings of God. It just seemed like the, when God blessed them, they would become complacent. And then they would complain, and they would fall, find themselves looking outside of the ark of safety, looking outside of Israel. As we read in this, this, the beginning of this chapter, as they were complaining, the anger, of the, Lord was, the anger of the Lord was kindled on them, and the fire of the Lord began to burn around the outside edges of the, the camp of Israel. And uh, I just look at that, there's the people that had themselves out on the very edge. They wanted to live as close, as close to the wilderness as they could get, but they were also a part of the church. They were a part of the children of Israel. But they began to complain, and when one begins to complain, they don't just sit, keep their complaints to themselves, but they begin to complain to somebody else. And it got down to where uh, Moses' cousin Korah, and some of them be, were complaining about the, Moses being in control, and Moses doing this, and Moses doing that. And they said, you're not the only person that God speaks to. And if you've read the story of Korah and the 250, you would understand that they were not submitted to their leadership. And God opened the ground and swallowed them up. And pe- the people were afraid. But I don't think we should live in fear of God. I think we need to live in submission to Him. Amen? You can complain. You can get used to life. And life goes on. We get so comfortable. And we begin to look around at the things around us. And we begin to complain. And we put people... We begin to look at things in life and pretty soon it's not long until we start picking people apart. We start finding fault with others because we don't have anything else to do. We've lost our focus. We've lost our affection. We've lost our attention. How many know somebody that you listen to them long enough and they can't go very long without saying something about somebody else? 
Nowhere in the Bible does it, does it tell us to tear our brother down, but it tells us to encourage one another and lift one another up. Even in life without the church, you should always be encouraging somebody or lifting somebody up. or looking for the good in people and not the bad. Because we are human beings. And our nature is to be sinful and to do things our way and do things wrong. And sometimes we just make mistakes. And we live in a world that wants everybody to forgive, to forgive them, but they don't want to forgive anybody else. But I have found that there's a God who loves us enough. That even in all of our failures, in all of our complaints, in all of our looking the wrong direction, the Bible says there was sometimes he just had to kindle his anger because there was a man standing in the gap for them. And his name was Moses, and he prayed, God, don't, don't bring your judgment upon them. But if you do anything, just bring it through me and let me, let me talk to them and let me, let me bring this out to them so they can understand. God had provided them. He had provided them with good health. He had provided them with, so they never had to worry about going to Walmart or going to Kmart or going to uh, TJ Maxx or Kohl's. They never had to go buy shoes. They didn't, they didn't have to find the latest style. They didn't have to do any of that stuff. So while they walked in the wilderness, God provi- kept their clothes from falling apart and shredding. He kept their, their feet, and they never had to buy new shoes. He kept their health. Their feet never swelled from all of the walking and all the things that they had done. God had granted them, and He had guarded them, and He had, he had protected them. But yet there was something in them that always they had to find a place to complain. They just got, had gotten used to the blessings and the provisions of God. It's just in some people's DNA to be a complainer. How many knows a Debbie Downer? I'm sorry, Sister Debbie. <laughs> I don't mean... But we've all heard that phrase, haven't we? He's a Debbie Downer. And all, every time you talk to them, all they have is something negative. There's something to say to bring others down. And the, the worst thing that we can do as a church or as a people of God when somebody's going through a trial is to go dr- start dragging them down with other junk and other things that aren't necessary to bring into their lives to make them have more trouble and more confusion and more tr- uh, problems making decisions and finding their way to Christ. Paul said, I have learned to be content in the state that I am in because that is where God wants you. As long as you're following Him, where He leads me, I will follow. When, he, when the pillar of cloud stops, we stop. That's the, prov- that's the provision, that's the protection of God. All the time they were in the wilderness, they never had have san- suntan lotion. Because the cloud covered them by day. God cares about every little detail in your life. And God had given Moses the law. The weakness of the law was that it could discover it, but it could not destroy it. It could discover the problem in your life. It could discover the sin in your life, but the law couldn't destroy the sin in your life. Does that make sense? It could check it, but it could not conquer it. And many of us today, we we know there's things in our life that can be checked, but we cannot conquer the sin that's in our life. That's why Jesus came to this earth. He didn't come. He didn't come to this earth just to to walk here, but He came and took took our place. He became our sacrifice. That lamb or that bull or that goat could not take the place of your sin. Those sacrifices only rolled back every year as the, as the high priest went into the Holy of Holies. And they rolled back and they rolled back to the next year and they rolled back clear until Calvary, until Jesus, the perfect Lamb, came and sacrificed Himself. And He made a way of escape for every one of us. This afternoon, we live, in, we live in a world that's looking for something. They're looking for a hope. They're looking for a place. And then there's some people that have walked with God along uh, for a while and they find themselves wishing like these people. They begin to complain and they, they find themselves looking back into Egypt. I never want to go back to the place where the bondage was. Oh, there might have been good food. 
There might have been onions and there might have been herbs, but I don't want to just remember the world that I was in because of the pleasure things that were there. Most people that come out of the world were bound by something. They had a need or they had something that caused them to want to get out of the bondage that they were in. And don't look, and, don't look back and say, I remember the herbs and the onions. I just want to go back to, so I can eat freely and do the things that I want to do. But I, you'll find yourself again in the slave, in the bondage of, of Satan and of this world. They don't leave you alone. It started out just making a few bricks and doing this. And then as they begin to grow, Pharaoh began to tighten the reins. And Pharaoh put more bondage and more on them than they could bear. And that's what caused them to reach out to, to God and say, deliver us from the bondage. Deliver us from this hardship that we're in. Most of us come to the Lord because we are bound. We have a hardship. We have something that we're going through. We have a need that's greater than us that we can't get out of. And it seems like the taskmaster is just whipping us a little harder. He's just moving on us a little bit more. But there's something about the power of God when you call upon His name. I don't know if you're ready to come out of bondage today. But I don't want to go back to the bondage or the slavery. To the cruel task that this world has on us. He's, got, he's brought me too far for me to turn around now. He's done too much for me. He's been too good to me for me to go back and want to go back to Egypt. I know the trip. I know the trip through the wilderness sometimes seems like it's a long way. It was only a 15-day journey to the promised land for the children of Israel. But God had to take them down to the Red Sea. Why did He take them to the Red Sea? Because Pharaoh was coming after them. And if there wasn't a Red Sea, Pharaoh would have never, and his army would have never drowned behind them. God took them to the Red Sea so that He could destroy that which was chasing them and trying to get them back. In his fold. He took them. He took them through the wilderness. Because they were not ready to do battle in Canaan. They had just been beaten. They had just had all kinds of things taken out on them. And they had to get out and they had to do some healing. And they had to get some strength back in their bodies. And they had to go through those things. But in the middle of the wilderness... Some of them began to complain. Why is it taking so long for us to get to where we're going? God maybe God is when God gets you ready and he gets you ready to use you, he's going to take you through a place. He's going to destroy the enemy, but he's also going to give you strength and he's going to give you confidence and he's going to be there for you when you need him. God gave these guys, the, the children of Israel, the man to sustain them and give them strength and to help them. They were not ready to face. If they had went into Jericho right out of Egypt, they would have been defeated. But God, they had to learn to depend on him. And we know the story of when they went into Jericho. If they'd have went too long, if they'd have went too soon, they would have lost the battle. God has taken everyone in this room to a place and to a purpose and to a cause and to a call. Some of your journeys may have to be longer because you have chosen to obey the ten spies instead of Joshua and Caleb and listen to the voice of those of faith. Sometimes we wander longer in the wilderness than we need to. But God still provided for us while we were walking through that wilderness. And when it came time and the, and, and the rains changed from Moses to Joshua and they came to the river and the Lord gave them uh, the Jordan River and God gave them instruction to go across just like He did the Red Sea. When they stepped their foot out to the Jordan River, the rivers dried up. And they walked across on dry land. And when I preached a few weeks ago, they, in the middle of that river, they gra gathered some stones and they built an altar, an altar of permanence where somebody could go back. It was a memorial for them.
There's a place and a moment of decision that every one of us have to make this afternoon. There's a pastor that's standing before you today that has stood in the gap, that prays, that has lamented for days over some people and over some situations and circumstances. I don't understand everything, but I know one thing. You've got to make up your mind this afternoon. You've got to make up in your heart that that you are not going back to Egypt. You, you can't think the thoughts that it was better when I was in the world because you... How many are better off because than you how many were better off in the world than you are now? If I could just if everyone could get up here and give your testimony. And I preached it on Thursday night. When people give their testimony, if if their testimony is more focused on the things they used to do and not on Jesus Christ, they may have a little problem with their testimony, who they're giving glory to. I don't care what you do in this life and what goes on in your life. Jesus is the better of it all. Amen? He done so much for me, I cannot tell it all. He brought me out of a horrible pit. I can tell you what, at 15 years of age, I was headed down the wrong road. But God got a hold of my heart as a 15-year-old young man, and He changed me. He, he put something in my spirit that I... Have I been perfect? No, I have not. Have I done wrong? Lots of wrong. But I also have found a place of repentance with Him because there's a drawing in my spirit. I don't want to go back to the world. I don't want to go back to the things of the world. And I told on Thursday, Beverly told me my brother Andy has no hope, really, unless the Lord intervenes. And I told Beverly, all he has to do is give his heart back to Jesus and repent of his sins and say, God, I'm sorry for what you've done for me. And God will take him back. He'll bring him out of Egypt again and he'll put him in that place where he wants him to be. I believe the Lord can heal him, but more importantly than his healing, because you can go to, he you can go to heaven with maimed or hurt or blind or with a limb missing, but you can't go to heaven with sin in your heart. you got to think, it's just a moment, the trials and the tests and the tribulations. But God has always provided the needs. Isn't it amazing how God doesn't give you the directions for tomorrow, today? We have to plan our lives. We have to pray and be and be. Sensitive to the Holy Ghost or to the Lord. And He will lead us and guide us. But you don't know what's going to down the road sometimes 30 days from now. Is that the truth? Because if God lets you know everything in advance, you'd be in trouble. He wants you to learn to lean on Him. Depend on Him. I don't have the answers, but God does. God has the course of your life, and He just wants to take you. When the cloud moves, just say, Lord, when you start to move the cloud, the pillar of cloud, I'm going to go with you. I don't understand where we're going, but I know you've made me a promise, and I know you told us Canaan land is our promise, and we're going to that land of promise. It may take me a while to get there, and I don't understand why I have to stop at Mount Sinai. I don't know why I have to stop in Tabera, but I understand one thing, that I've got to understand to follow the leading of the Lord. Because if I start looking back to Egypt and all I remember is the onions and the herbs, it won't be long. Until that slew foot the devil has a foothold in our lives again and we become bound to the sin that once held us captive. My soul is stirred this afternoon. I, I don't really know how to convey what's in my heart. I, I wish I could get out of, out, of my, out of my heart what I feel today through my, through my mind and through my mouth. But God's been way too good for us. If you're in the middle of, if you are in Egypt and you want to come out today, all you've got to do is call on the name of the Lord. God is your provider. God is your healer. He is your deliverer. And he, all you have to do is be obedient to Him. If you go back and you read the, the story of the Exodus, God told them just to get yourself prepared. Burn, get a lamb, 
bring their family together and begin to feast. And then to go borrow, he said to go borrow from the Egyptians everything that you can borrow. God made provision for them before they ever left Egypt. And he took care of them. The tabernacle was built from the borrowed stuff of Egypt. Let's all stand. Brother Kenny, if you'll come to the keyboard. The first murmur or complaint about the route was about the, God, the route that God was leading them. It would have just been a, an 11 to 15 day route to get them where they were going, but God took them 150 miles out of the way. Why? Because there's things in Egypt that they need to get out of. There are traditions of Egypt that they need to get uh, away from. And he, God wanted them to see that if you just follow me, I'll take you to that place. God destroyed those on the outskirts that were stragglers. Maybe you camped out there just, they didn't really want to go along, but they didn't have much choice. And so they just, you know, that's probably where the complaining usually starts with the people that are closest to the world. Is that the truth? I, I don't think the people who serve and yield themselves have a whole lot of trouble with their walk with God. But it's those people that live out on the fringes. who stay out as far as they can, but yet they, they, they want to make sure they still feel the presence of God. But yet I'm, I, just, I just want to stay out here close enough so I can look out into the wilderness and out into Egypt, back into Egypt. Moses prayed in the fire. God quenched the fire. God stopped the fire. And we'll pray today. If there's fire and there's trouble and there's circumstances in your life, we will pray with you that the Lord will stop the fire and He will bring you to a place. Not that you remember and you want to go back and you want to eat the fish and you want to eat freely in Egypt, the herbs and the onions, but God wants to give you more than just herbs and onions. Because God is going to take you to a land that's flowing with milk and honey. When the spies went over into, into Canaan land, they came back with grapes on their shoulders, clusters of grapes. Can you imagine carrying a cluster of grapes? The, the grapes were so big that two men had to carry them on their shoulders. And we go into Walmart and they're about this big around and we, we sample one before we buy it. Tracy does, I don't. I'm just kidding. <laughs> She's looking at me funny. But can you imagine? But you know what they saw? The ten spies? They saw the giants. They didn't see the blessing. They saw the things that they had to fight to get what they were, God was going to give them. They didn't see that God was a provider. And everything that was there, the land that filled with milk, milk and honey, was theirs to glean off of and to, sh and, and to live off of. There were houses that they were going to live in that they didn't build because the Lord was going to take care of them and provide and give them and take them to the promise. If you can look over Jordan and someone's come back to tell you there's a Joshua and Caleb that says, man, things are great over there. We can take them. We can do it. We can't overcome the giants of Canaan. We can win every battle that the Lord takes us to because He made us a promise. But those ten, they just couldn't get over the fact that these men were way, way bigger than them. And there's a lot of times we look 
at an obstacle in our life and it's too close to us and it looks like a giant. It looks way too big. But when we step back and we allow the Lord, how many times as a kid you looked at somebody and you thought, man, they're huge. But when you grow up, they were about five foot four. <laughs> and they weren't, they weren't all that. But man, when you were little, they were intimidating. And sometimes we make giants Little thing, little things, giants that are not meant to be giants in your life. And I just think the Lord wants to help us today. Help us not to look back to Egypt. But let us look into the land that flows with milk and honey. Not believe the reports that we can't win the battle. Because every battle that you've been taken to and brought t- toward, the Lord will bless you. And he will help you to fight those battles. And he will help you to win. I don't know what you're fighting and what you're battling today. But there is a spirit of depression. There's a spirit of oppression. There's a spirit of hopelessness that's trying to grab this country and the, and the people of this country today. But it's not the will of God to live for us to live in hopelessness. It's not the will of God for us to live in bondage to somebody who tells us you can't, you can't overcome and you can't, live, you can't live that life. Because you are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. 